Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Ruth Zachrin, and I am the CEO of the Massachusetts Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. Really appreciate all of you being with us this evening for our quarterly meeting. Uh, we are really looking forward to spending some time with Chair Michael Day and talking about the recent legislation that was passed. Um, and we're thrilled to be with all of you, our coalition community, um, as we welcome October and do a little bit of celebration of this very important legislation that has been passed. Um, thrilled to see all of you. Uh, and we're gonna have some time, we're gonna do some announcements, uh, talk a little bit with Chair Day about this legislation, have some time for questions and answers, and then we're gonna tie things up by talking a bit about this ballot initiative that folks have likely been hearing about so we can give you some updates and let you know where things stand. Uh, but without further ado, I'm gonna jump into our agenda for today. And just to start with a couple of announcements, a week from tonight, we are having a celebration, a chance for our coalition community to come together and celebrate the passage of the bill and also enjoy being with each other. It's going to be held at a small brewery called Long Live Roxbury, which as you can tell from the title is in Roxbury, close to the South End border. Uh, we will be putting some information into the chat so you can access uh, the, the details about it and also tickets. It will be held from 6 to 8 p.m. again on Tuesday, October 8th. We will also be enjoying some food from Gourmet Creole, which if you're not familiar, is a Haitian-owned uh, food truck in the area that's going to be providing some great food for us to enjoy that evening. So I hope that you can join us for that event. And a couple of other Quick announcements. I'm excited to say that we have started a new function on our website, a community events calendar. So if you're interested to know what's happening with member organizations or events happening in the community related to gun violence, we will be updating that regularly. And if you're with one of our member organizations and have events that you would like to submit to the calendar, uh, Caitlin from our staff will be available to answer questions about that and put information in the chat about how you can do that. Um, and the last quick announcement is we've been very excited to work with a local artist named Haas to create a podcast that has been highlighting the work that we have been doing around the documentary, This Ain't Normal, and also sharing voices from the community around different issues related to gun violence. And we rolled out the first episode a few weeks ago. Another one is forthcoming. And you can find the podcast on all of our social media platforms. Uh, so it's been a really exciting opportunity to tell stories um, about different aspects of gun violence and folks who have been touched by it. So that's just a couple of quick updates about things going on at the coalition. Uh, but since Chair Day is with us now, I want to make sure that we get into that content and appreciate his time with us. So I would like to officially welcome Chair Michael Day, uh, who is joining us today to talk about this really important legislation that was just passed mere weeks ago. And a little bit about Chair Day. Uh, he was sworn into office in January of 2015 representing the 31st Middlesex District. And he now serves as the House Chair of the Joint Committee on the Judiciary. And what I learned today from looking at his bio on the State House website is that in addition to having three children, he also has one dog, four chickens, and three fish. Um, so just a fun fact about Chair Day, uh, but without further ado, I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. I do have to confess that uh, bio is dated. Uh, we no longer have chickens, the raccoons took care of them. Uh, we have another dog though, so we've got two dogs uh, and two guinea pigs. The fish have met their timely demise as well. But the, uh, the, the surrogate stone zoo, I guess, continues as I live in stone. Amazing. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and I have a couple of questions that I have prepared uh, to ask you just to really move us through this whole process with the bill. And then again, we're going to be making time for folks to also ask questions. And we 
would uh, love it if folks have questions that they could put them in the chat uh, so that we can moderate them and um, be efficient with being able to get to as many questions as possible. And feel free to use the chat to add your questions as we are going along. So um, thank you again, Chair Day, for being with us. I know this has been a long couple of years of advocacy and work on this critical legislation. And I really wanted for folks to get a pretty comprehensive view of how this process has worked. So before we get into the content of the bill, I'd really like to talk a bit about uh, what went into its creation. And at the coalition, we talk a lot about what is our why, um, why we're in this work, why this is so near and dear to our hearts to be working on addressing the trauma of gun violence. And you took on a really huge and central role in the process of making this legislation happen. And can you share with us a bit what your goal was and what needs you saw that needed to be met in this legislation? Sure. Um, thanks for the question, too. Um, and thank you all just at the outset for your work, your advocacy um, for gun safety. Um, you know, we're incredibly fortunate to live in Massachusetts uh, on a number of fronts. Um, certainly health, education, um, quality of life here. And a huge part of that quality of life and a huge part of the values that make us Massachusetts residents is our commitment to, to safety uh, of each other. Uh, it's a commonwealth, right? And um, I think you see that borne out in our laws that really do, I think, strike the balance between personal liberty and communal safety. And I think uh, at the heart of that piece, certainly over the last couple of years uh, of my time here in the, in the legislature has been a focus on on gun safety. Um, we, when I got appointed by Speaker Mariano to chair judiciary, um, one of the things we undertook was a review of the Supreme Court's dockets uh, and monitoring what was coming, what wasn't, and flagging for different chairs as well as uh, different groups and leaders what we we anticipated coming out of a a new Supreme Court. Uh, and one of the ones that jumped up highest, unfortunately, um, in addition to the rollback of Roe. Uh, the very damaging, I think, Bruin decision as well. We saw that coming. We had tracked that. We had prepared um, our colleagues for it. And the Speaker, Speaker Mariano, um, for those of you who weren't around that long, um, really took a central role in the last time we undertook comprehensive um, firearm reform back in 2014 and was a central figure in driving that over the finish line. Um, he, you know, is a former school teacher um, and takes this issue incredibly seriously and tasked me with um, working with then Attorney General Healy's office, now Governor Healy, uh, and our colleagues in the Senate in coming up with a response to whatever that decision was going to look like in Bruin. We did that fairly quickly, um, working with Governor Baker's office as well at the time, and got a, um, a law passed within, within a week of the Bruin decision, uh, making sure that our laws uh, conformed to the, the strictures of the decision, but also uh, preserved you know, our framework here in Massachusetts. And as that uh, played out, there were a few different initiatives that folks were pushing. And, and so the speaker tasked me with really uh, taking a deep dive on our laws. Uh, we heard complaints from uh, members of the, the 2A community that our laws were convoluted, that they didn't make sense, that they were contradictory. Um, and we also knew that uh, 10 years had gone by, there was quite a bit of development um, in the firearm area that we just hadn't addressed in our laws, we hadn't kept up with. And so we undertook a, a comprehensive look at that, both scholarly, as well as, uh, you know, you'd indicate a little bit earlier with the, the road show we took on, um, listening tour, uh, where we visited every corner of Massachusetts to hear directly from uh, residents, uh, interest groups, as well as um, our colleagues in the legislature. And so that motivated um, the bill. Um, you may have seen some of the signs of stopping HD 4420 populating and popping up um, around the neighborhoods. That was the bill that we unveiled uh, back in the 4th of July weekend, uh, well, I guess a year or two ago now, um, that served as a kind of flashpoint and conversation starter in what we ultimately passed this past July, uh, where we worked with the Senate uh, on their bill and got a, a bill over the finish line that Governor Healy signed quickly. And it's um, you know one of the most comprehensive rewrites um, of a firearm safety law uh, that we've undertaken here in Massachusetts. I, I think, I guess I'll, I'll say, to, to answer your question a little more directly, you know, the name of your podcast is This Ain't Normal. Um, it was becoming normalized, right? Uh, firearm violence uh, was becoming normalized. People were becoming numb to it. We no longer reacted in shock 
when we heard about a shooting in their streets, never mind in our schools. Um, people were coming kind of numb to it. Um, and the fact that it was becoming accepted uh, really is anathema to me uh, when it's something that we can control and make sure that we strike the proper balance. So the normalization really is what uh, kind of went up me sideways to, to use a technical term. Thank you for that. And we always appreciate technical terms at the coalition. <laughs> so we learned a new one. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had opportunity to hear you speak frequently about this bill and the work. And I know it's something that you really feel passionately about. And I wanted to give you the chance to share that with our coalition community as well. And just going back to the listening tour, and if folks are not familiar with that, I think there were 12 stops on the listening tour leading up to the creation of the bill in all corners of the state and share day. And I got to spend some quality time together at many of those listening stops. Um, and they covered not just a range of communities, but a range of different topic areas um, related to gun violence. And I would love it if you could share with us a bit about what you took from that listening tour, what you learned, what came up for you and how that shaped the eventual creation of this bill. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it was certainly educational um, when we were we didn't really have a, a plan in place uh, when we got the first Bruin piece done, uh, the initial response done. Um, my staff and I were going through the traditional routes of, you know, diving into the history books, diving into other states, doing the 50 state survey, uh, listening to different advocacy groups, this one included. Um, but we really thought it was important. I took a lesson from my predecessor, uh, who's now the ambassador to Ireland, uh, then chair Claire Cronin when she undertook um, a, a endeavor dealing with reproductive rights and she had every single state representative meet with her about their thoughts and their concerns and what they wanted to, to see in the legislative response. So we, I borrowed from that lesson um, by saying, we're not gonna have them in our office here. We're gonna go and meet them in their own backyards. So we, we kind of mapped out that as 11 stops uh, with the 12th being at the state house for the final hearing. Uh, there. And we picked, um, you know, the the formats were all the same. We had a panel focusing on a particular issue, uh, and then we opened it up to a, a wide open Q&A and, and um, opinion section, I guess, so that we did really listen uh, to that. Some folks um, during that uh, would, would kind of chastise me or, or come at me a little bit and saying, you're not responding. How come you're not, you know, picking this up or, or countering what I just said? And that the goal really was to listen. Uh, and so we didn't get into debates. We offered a, a topic, had some experts on all sides of the um, spectrum, uh, the political spectrum on those panels so that we could hear a representative voice and then open it up just to, to allow people to talk to us. Um, I think what you, you saw from folks that oppose this law is a cheapening of that process where they say, this is rushed, they didn't listen to us. And I keep pointing out the fact that we don't agree with you doesn't mean we don't hear you. Um, we can have honest disagreements and we can have disagreements on the ultimate policy, but we certainly, uh, I learned quite a bit during that, that tour as well, um, about, you know, everyone's different perspectives on this issue. It certainly is a, uh, hot button issue. Um, the passions as you're seeing both from, um, you know, what I'll call the two A community, um, as well as the, the other side of the issue. Um, it's, it's about life and death to me. Uh, and, and so that necessarily rises passions. Um, what I try to do is just kind of take the, the hot out of that conversation as much as possible and have a rational discussion about what is in, what isn't in, and why, as opposed to this kind of broadside that you're hearing of, it's an assault on, it's the biggest assault on civil rights in our history. Uh, it's the whole bill is terrible. Um, those aren't discussions that are productive, but the ones that we had, I think, during the listening tour, and certainly as it's continuing this process, have been productive when you can go one-on-one -on -one, uh, or even in a small group setting and get into some of the details. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, having attended many of those sessions myself, and I know a lot of the folks on the screen here attended some of those sessions. And I also just wanna shout out everyone who's been a part of this process, these things, these bills never happen in a vacuum. It is always because a lot of folks put a lot of effort and time into calling for change and advocating and putting in the work. And there are a lot of folks on the screen with us today who were very involved and really did a lot of advocacy. So I want to appreciate all of you as well. And many of you attended some of these listening sessions. And I just want to acknowledge that some of these sessions went very long because 
you made sure that everyone had a chance to speak. And so everyone who wanted to have a voice in those sessions did. Um, and it meant that some of those evenings went pretty late. Uh, but I do want to acknowledge how much intention was put into making sure that people did get to participate and voice their favor or their concerns around what was happening with this process. And, and that took a lot of time. And I think, Ruth, uh, I'll echo that gratitude um, to all participants and, and those who attended. Um, certainly some of the passions ran high, but I think you found a lot of common ground during those discussions as well. <laughs> Pardon me. Uh, which was which was nice to see. Now, we didn't get to accord on, on all issues, but I think there was certain uh, points of agreement that maybe surprised some that we were able to get to. Thank you. And just a reminder to folks, please do as you have questions, put them in the chat. But what I would love to do right now, Chair Day, is just give you a chance to champion this critical legislation and tell us some of the major components of the bill. Sure, thanks. Um, it is comprehensive, uh, so I hope I don't bore you all, but I'll run through just kind of top lines and then be happy to, to chat further on this as well as the developments since the governor signed it. Um, we really took a... a, a a deep dive on this area. Um, and so we, we address everything from uh, putting a standard in for intoxication while using a firearm, to safe storage, to training, to licensing, um, to extreme risk protective order. So I'll just kind of rip through those quickly and give you top lines on where we are. With respect to training, um, we've now required or will be requiring live firearm training um, for the first time in Massachusetts. 13 other states have that. Um, we are also uh, now implementing a uniform test uh, for the training. So there's a there's a bare bones training requirement in Massachusetts now. Um, a lot of it is left up to the individual trainers. We've tasked the Massachusetts State Police with promulgating uniform curriculum and a standardized test that uh, an applicant now has to pass. And that'll cover things like de-escalation um, when you have a firearm in an incident, as well as safe storage and knowledge of the firearm laws. And again, the live firearm component coming in saying, if you're gonna carry a firearm, you should learn how to use it safely and properly. So that's a, a fairly significant step forward um, in there. We've got um, some clarification on issues that uh, dumbfounded me that we had to. So firing at a, a dwelling or discharging a firearm within certain feet of a dwelling uh, wasn't particularly well drafted. So we revisited that and tightened that up at the request of our district attorneys. Um, we've taken a great step forward on the compilation and collection and uh, dissemination of firearm data. Um, you know, a lot of folks who say you're not getting at the issue, how many people were licensed uh, that got, you know, arrested for firearms crimes. Uh, that data is lacking, frankly. And so we've implemented uh, essentially a, a dashboard as we did with criminal justice reform, where we're requiring uh, decedents and other entities to put in that data, including our local uh, law enforcement professionals. That'll now feed into a centralized database. It'll be anonymized, uh, but scholars and individuals will now be able to go in there as well as policymakers and kind of slice and dice and see really what's having an impact, what's not um, in there. So that's one of the bigger pieces um, that I'm proud of as well. Um, we took a real run at uh, the issue of ghost guns, uh, these kind of Frankenstein um, firearms that are being put together, either 3D printed or you know, uh, taken parts from here and there and created. Um, and we did that by requiring them to be serialized now and putting a fairly significant penalty in if they're not. A federally manufactured firearm has to be serialized since the 1960s. So the vast majority of what you see in the streets will have a serial number on it. Um, we've tightened up on the back end of that, our registration system, so that it's no longer limited just to the sales portal. Um, there'll be an affirmative obligation to register your firearms as well, so that now we'll know where did this gun come from if it's used in, in a crime, um, or if it's not, that individual's uh, going to be liable for uh, criminal prosecution just by the possession of that. Uh, we've defined them as frames receivers. So a lot of what we were hearing from our law enforcement professionals was, Mike, we're going into these houses that are clearly manufacturing um, arsenals, but because they're not assembled, we can't charge them with illegal possession of a firearm. So we address that by defining the firearm frame or receiver itself as a firearm. That now has to be serialized and registered. Um, and if you're caught without that, uh, you're, you're now looking at illegal possession. That's a huge step forward, I think, um, on, on getting these guns kind of off of our, our streets and our neighborhoods. 
Um, that goes along with the, the reporting tracing requirements, our prime gun tracing requirements. What we found and what we heard was that ATF wasn't talking to our state police who wasn't talking to our local police. And so now we've streamlined that by requiring the reporting of data um, from our law enforcement professionals so that all will talk to each other and we'll be able to track this, um, you know, the, the marketing or, or I should say the trafficking of illegal firearms across state lines, but also within Massachusetts itself. Um, so a fairly significant move forward on that end, I think, as well. We've criminalized uh, the possession of uh, modification devices. So we all know about Glock switches, unfortunately, turns a, a handgun into an automatic um, weapon. Um, again, law enforcement say, Mike, we, we've, we've got them. They've got 50 of these things in their hands, but because they're not attached to the firearm at that time, we can't charge them with it. So now the possession of those devices that are intended only to turn a firearm into an assault weapon um, will be criminalized itself um, on that end as well. We increased our extreme risk protective order laws. Um, before you were either had to be a family member or the local licensing authority, uh, usually the police chief, to go in and petition a court uh, under due process rules to uh, put an extreme risk protective order against an individual who had access to a firearm and was presenting themselves as a danger to themselves or others at that time. Um, we've now expanded that list of individuals who can petition so that healthcare professionals who have treated that individual in the last six months, uh, as well as school administrators, um, and uh, law enforcement professionals who may not be the chiefs can now go in when they see an individual in distress and ask the court to temporarily remove that access to the firearm um, during that crisis period. We think that's a, a great step forward um, on that end as well. Um, a few other pieces that I'll, I'll wrap up here. We've streamlined the licensing of firearm process and made it more transparent. So we heard from a lot of individuals who were asking uh, to get licensed they didn't know where their application was. They couldn't find out where it was or what was happening with it. That's now we've mandated um, that that be put on, a, a, again, a bit of a dashboard so that people can find out where they are in the application process. The process itself is cleaner and smoother um, on that end. And then we heard a lot, uh, obviously, in the in the wake of the Littleton Mill, um, that these dealers, uh, some of these dealers were trying to, you know, I won't even call them dealers, but they were skirting the edges of the law and evading uh, their responsibilities. And so um, when we talked to our some of our law enforcement professionals, that, that was tasked to our local chiefs. Uh, a lot of them were saying, we don't, number one, have the capacity to do that as often as we should be. And two, we don't have the training uh, that we're supposed to have on how we do this. So we've now uh, mandated the training or you know required them to go through uh, that training. The administration is gonna be offering it. And we've also allowed them to say, it's beyond our capacity right now. The Mass State Police will take that responsibility over on a uniform basis to try to close that loophole up as well um, on that end. Last bit uh, I'll say is we've codified the Attorney General, the former Attorney General, now Governor's 2016 opinion on assault style firearms and the copycat issue um, that Governor Healy uh, put out in 2016. That was an advisory opinion. We've codified that now. We've also codified um, the, the assault style firearms definition and updated and modernized those characteristics that we look at when you're determining whether or not a firearm is an assault style firearm uh, or whether it's simply a long gun. Um, those are kind of the big pieces. Last one I'll, I'll close on, I guess, is the prohibited areas where we've uh, made sure that our practice is now in law so that firearms are prohibited um, in polling places, they are prohibited in government buildings and they're prohibited in our schools. Those are the big three um, that we were able to get over the finish line. There were some negotiations going on on that. There was some disagreement between the chambers, but those are the ultimate uh, decision that we arrived at and got passed at the law by Governor Hill. Sorry to throw all that at you all so quickly. Um, those are kind of the top line headlines that I wanted to, to at least um, get out there for, for you all if you weren't following it. But I have a feeling this group's a little more engaged than some of the others, so they had some insight onto it already. Well, thank you for all that. I mean, I think it really shows how comprehensive this is. Um, I think the final version was 116 pages. So the fact that you were able to drill down 116 pages in a few minutes is um, <laughs> impressive and appreciated. Um, and I think there'll be opportunity to dig deeper into some of the components. But one of the things that I did want to share, I just came back from being in DC at a National Gun Violence Prevention Summit and heard from 
colleagues in so many other states, just how impressed they were that we were able to do such a comprehensive piece of legislation here in Massachusetts that had, you know, pieces around regulating access to guns, addressing ghost guns, and also some pieces that address community violence intervention and funding and really um, I, taking yeah. a very intentional look at that. And so folks really appreciated that. And I see we are starting to get some questions, but I just wanted to ask you one more question, Chair Dave, before we open up to questions from our audience. Um, you know, we know that there are challenges ahead and you referenced it briefly in your comments. And we're gonna talk about that more too, so we can update folks on, on you know, what we understand and where things stand at this point. But um, we know that there is an effort to get signatures to put this on the 2026 ballot. And as we think about challenges ahead, I'd love to hear some, your thoughts about what the coalition community can do to champion this very important legislation and make sure the general public is excited about it and, and ready to work to protect it. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, so there's a uh, certainly a, co a coordinated effort to try to uh, get this on the ballot in 2026. I anticipate that will be successful in that they'll get a ballot question and the question would repeal the law in its entirety and revert it back to um, to where we were before we passed this. Um, as of tomorrow, uh, Governor Healy confirmed today that she's gonna be signing what we call an emergency preamble, which would mean the law would be in effect immediately as of her signing that. Um, we didn't put an emergency preamble on that bill because there were certain deadlines we needed to give the administration um, time to meet. So certain regs that they needed to pass through, certain trainings they needed to come up with. Um, in working with the Healy administration, they've assured us that they can meet those deadlines, uh, that they've been working on those. And so it'll be obviously rolling out in stages, certain pieces, the live firearm training, for example, is 18 months after the effective date of the bill. Um, so there are different trigger times for that, but the bill itself, uh, I'm sorry, the law itself now goes into effect uh, upon the governor signing that, what we call the EP, the emergency preamble. Um, it's a wrinkle in our constitution uh, in that uh, a group of residents can uh, sign a petition if there is no emergency preamble. It's normally a 90 day window before a law takes effect um, where they can submit signatures and have a suspension of that law until the ballot petition is heard. Um, and again, the counter to that is any governor can sign an emergency preamble and put that law into effect immediately. That's what Governor Healy is doing now. Uh, I think you're seeing obviously uh, the 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 numbers of fatalities, the number of, of firearm tragedies continue to occur in Massachusetts. And so um, there's no real surprise that we want this law to take effect as soon as possible um, because the governor's administration has been working hard. They've met, met their internal deadlines uh, to be able to give effect to it. And so they don't need the full 90 days. And my understanding is they're gonna sign that tomorrow, uh, which would mean the law will be fully in place and effectual tomorrow. Um, that will not have an impact on the ballot question, which would be for 2026. So that'll be two years away. Uh, but to, to your question, Ruth, um, you know, there's a lot of, of um, distortion that goes on, certainly with this bill uh, that became the law, uh, and that continues. Uh, we're constantly answering questions from our colleagues in a good faith manner who said, look, we just heard that um, you, you made a mistake and you're now allowing uh, or you're prohibiting Lexington and Concord reenactments. Uh, and so we said, no, no, we didn't do that. Here's what the law says. Here's what it's continuing to say. Um, that's not a firearm. That's a reenactment. We've got a specific term for that. Or uh, you're not allowing, you know, my 17 year old to go hunting with me anymore. You prohibited that. No, that's not accurate either. It's the law has remained unchanged in that area. As long as that individual is being supervised by somebody with a proper license, they can go hunting. Um, so a lot of that kind of, I call it chicken little, um, routine for some folks that says, you know, they're taking away my rights they're taking away my guns. They're ending my ability to defend myself um, is not accurate. Uh, and when you drill in on the details um, that walks, that melts away. The problem is it's a lot easier to, to throw that chicken little routine out um, than it is to counter these with individual answers. And so I think that's where the advocacy groups you included um, can be hugely important is walking back that narrative um, that is inaccurate about what this law does and what it doesn't do. Um, we can certainly do our part here in the legislature of, of, you know, trying to educate our constituents, but many, many voices help quite a bit on that end. 
You appreciate that. And, and something that we talk about a lot is just the core values of why we're in this work, which is to save lives and to prevent the trauma of gun violence and the right of all of us to be safe from gun violence. So that's a message that we will continue to not just amplify, but really drill down because that's what this work is truly all about. So thank you for your partnership with us in making that happen. Um, and now I'm going to try to do my best to keep up with the questions that are coming in the chat. Um, so this is a two-part question that I would like to pose to you. First, what is the rationale behind the requirement that an ERPO petitioner go to the police station or court that services the city or town where the respondent resides? This requirement is deterrent and even a prohibition for petitioners who are unable to get to that police station or court um, where the respondent resides. Financial lack of access to transportation, childcare, work, all present obstacles. And the second part is what is the guidance given to those petitioners who cannot overcome that burden? So I, I think uh, I'm trying to see if I understand the question. It's why did we require you to go to the courthouse uh, where the, the resident lives that you're seeking an ERPO against. That's due process right. law. Uh, those are our due process laws, right? So we that's that's the law in place for all restraining orders. You go, uh, an individual is entitled when you're, you're depriving them of a legal right um, uh, for any period of time. They're entitled to be heard and um, to be have those presented where they are. So our restraining order, our 209A, our anti-harassment orders, our ERPOs, are all based out of that uh, individual's residence. That's where you go. That's where the order would be given effect, where the police would be then empowered to go seize those firearms. If I'm living in Stoneham and uh, you're, you're seeking a restraining order against me out in Pittsfield, the Pittsfield police can't go out to Stoneham and you know give, give force to that. So you go to where the resident lives uh, on that end. There are um, certainly different avenues uh, if the individual, uh, him or herself, can't get to that court. But this is really designed um, to allow you to, to take advantage of that by calling law enforcement in that jurisdiction, um, by uh, you know the medical professionals, to the extent that they're going forward, um, presumably don't have those obstacles, but can certainly make an appearance as well uh, to, to pursue that uh, temporary restraining order. I don't know if that helped to answer it or not. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump to a couple more questions because I want to make sure we get some more in before we run out of time. Uh, but speaking of law enforcement, there were some questions about um, the involvement of law enforcement and public safety officials in this process of creating the bill and the final version. Yep, so uh, fully, very involved. Um, we had multiple meetings. Uh, obviously, uh, we had law enforcement present at all um, of our listening stops. We had um, uh, chiefs. Uh, I think at, at, I'd say at least eight, I believe, we had local chiefs up on the panels to discuss how they um, uh, enforce the laws and in their views as well. We met uh, often with the uh, Mass Chiefs of Police Association, MACOPA, they call it, um, and they they presented us with, uh, you know, a lot of feedback on the initial proposal, 4420, uh, that we then took in, and some of it we agreed with, some of it we didn't agree with. So some of it made it into the, the revised bill um, and others didn't. And you saw the Senate engage in a, a different process for their bill. Uh, and then at the end of the day, as you do with all uh, different legislation, we conference that together. Um, but the chiefs uh, and other law enforcement were certainly heard both in their professional and personal capacity um, on that end and, and had input into, you know, I think at the end of the day, making the law uh, that we passed a better law. Um, some of it was education of us. Some of it was education of of law enforcement as to why we were looking at certain areas. And I think at the end of the day, you saw them, um, you know, come on board to support the final package, which, you know, wasn't all that different from um, the second piece that we dropped um, after the, the first hearing. Great, right. thank you. Um, moving on to another question. This is more around implementation. Uh, and the questioner is interested in how state agencies will educate relevant groups in the public who now have the authority to submit an ERPO request to a judge, i.e. health professional schools, et cetera. Will there be a marketing campaign or specific trainings, pamphlets? And if so, when will this be available and where can the general public find these resources? Yeah, great question. So uh, as with any law, the legislature kind of sets the, the uh, yardsticks. And then we entrust the administrative uh, branch 
the governor uh, and her administration to implement that law. And that's where the regulations come into play. Um, the law will set the, the boundaries, the regulations will fill in the details on that. Um, a lot of that will come through um, direct education to the stakeholders, so to our courts, to our uh, the bar associations as well, um, and to the medical professionals. We'll trust the administration to make sure that education goes out to the extent that it requires funding. That's what we're here for in the legislature. Um, but this is uh, you know, really no different than any other law we pass uh, that has some substantive changes to what we do. We, we did it in criminal justice reform in 2018. We did it with police reform in 2020. Um, it's about educating the public. It's also about educating those involved in both the, the criminal justice system as well as the judicial system and the healthcare system. Uh, and so we've been in discussions with all of those entities um, to make sure that their groups and their constituencies are aware of these changes. Um, the regulations will go through the normal process where they'll have public hearings on proposed regs where you can certainly weigh in um, on those. And then that'll be spun out into public um, regulations that'll that'll take effect after they're promulgated. We did- uh, Thank you. Kind of a bit, sorry, just to follow up, uh, you know, we, we did another um, significant change to our restraining order laws earlier this year with respect to coercive control. Um, that was never a term in our restraining order laws. It's a form of domestic violence that's particularly insidious because it doesn't involve physical control. Um, that is a, a significant change to our law. We've been working with the courts, creating, uh, they're creating, you know, crib sheets for individuals who come in on a pro se basis without attorneys. They're also doing bench cards, they call, so that they can educate the, the judges themselves on these changes of the law. They'll sit literally right beside the judge uh, when that person's on the bench. So there are a number of different ways of doing that. Um, our law enforcement professionals, this will be taught in the uh, mass police training academies, uh, as well as educational pieces going out to the particular um, departments throughout the Commonwealth. And I'm so glad that you brought that up. It's so critically important as I think you know, my background is in working with survivors of domestic and sexual violence and the intersection of domestic violence and gun violence is so significant that I see that as almost being an extension of how of just this larger package of how we keep people safe um, from all forms of violence. So I really appreciate you bringing that up as well. Um, another question, um, and I'm going to read this verbatim. When I was going to the Harvard School of Public Health several decades ago, there was a study that went to New Hampshire and trained gun dealers to recognize signs of suicide risk. The result was a decrease in suicide deaths by gun. Can that be added to the education of gun dealers? Sure, uh, there's certainly nothing prohibiting that. Um, we didn't get into that level of specificity with the come when it came to the training of dealers. But again, we trusted. Um, so I'll back up a little bit on the training. We didn't tell the the Mass State Police you have to include this specific language. We said you've got to cover these topics, and so those are areas that are wide open for regulation uh, from the administration on that end. Um, and I know there's there have been funds in the past uh, that we've sent across to law enforcement on training on suicide recognition. Um, but Ruth, your earlier point, none of this is done in a vacuum, right? We're not going to solve um, domestic violence by only addressing a restraining order issue. Uh, it's a multifaceted approach we need to take. And this is one of the pieces that we looked at when we when we did this firearm law is we can't just focus on assault weapons, right? Assault style firearms. We can't just focus on ghost guns. We need to have a comprehensive approach here if we're going to make things safer. And it's not limited to this law. It goes hand in glove with our mental health advances. It goes hand in glove with our uh, health care advances, as well as our educational advances. All of these work together to make us uh, safer and tighten up that net. Thank you for that. Um, and I just see we're going to run out of time quickly, but I see another quick question about the dashboard and where it will reside and be posted monthly or quarterly. So if you can speak to that a bit. Yeah. So again, here we've given the administration some time to get up and running to get their um, information technology services up and running. We've asked, we've required them to work uh, both the executive office of public safety to work with the executive office of technical uh, technology services to make sure that comes up uh, online. I think we gave them about a year to get this uh, fully implemented on the dashboard. I will caution, um, we did this in 2018 with criminal justice reform, and that dashboard's still not fully populated. We uh, in the legislature have been leaning on prior administration as well as this administration to, to fast track that. 
um, to make sure that data is available, but a lot of it is um, breaking down these silos in government and making sure that just because you're a court doesn't mean you're holding data back from a district attorney or law enforcement or the executive office itself. So we think because they had a head start on this type of a, a dashboard with criminal justice reform, the firearm data will come up online uh, on time, which is about a year from now. We also, I just want to uh, highlight, we, we intentionally did not put that under a private entity or you know, some California, for example, has um, affiliated themselves with a particular school that houses the data and, and conducts some of the studies. We wanted to make this publicly available and accessible to all uh, so that wh whomever goes in to make studies or pull data is able to do so. Which is amazing. We, you know, we talk at the coalition all the time about how you can't fully address an issue if you don't have the data to understand it. So making that more publicly available is huge. And, and we really appreciate that being included in this legislation. Um, I know we're running out of time, but Chair Day, I wanted to give you an opportunity if there's anything else that you wanted to share with us. This is a community of people that is pretty excited to support this work and support you and make sure that this legislation gets championed and protected and implemented well. So I wanted to give you the floor again, if there's anything else that you would like to share with us. I think just gratitude, um, you know, the, um, and I'm glad you used the word excitement. Uh, a lot of the uh, oxygen here has been taken up by a very small segment of our population. Uh, we're certainly loud and organized and that's their right and, and good on them for advocating for what they believe in. Um, but this, um, you know, this, this new law that'll be fully in effect tomorrow um, is gonna make us safer. It, it's gonna make everybody safer in Massachusetts. Um, and I think it's a landmark for the rest of the country. We had uh, you know, taken that lead in, in 2014. Other states had, had followed that lead and, and gone beyond us in certain respects. But I think this is really, um, obviously I'm a little biased uh, since I was involved in it, but I do think that the comprehensive nature of what we do here has tightened up uh, any, any kind of strings that frayed in our framework of laws for gun safety. It does strike the balance. I know there'll be opponents who say it's unconstitutional. It does strike the balance between constitutionality and safety. Uh, and so I'm, I'm thrilled uh, that we had an overwhelming vote in the legislature um, on both the House passage as well as the ultimate passage of this bill, um, where a lot of, of skeptics came around uh, once they realized what was in it and what it does. So um, that wouldn't have been possible without groups like yourselves advocating directly and kind of countering the narrative of the doomsday narrative uh, that you're hearing too often. So I, I just want to say thank you uh, to all of you for your work and your continued work. Um, obviously, we're going to have you know another challenge coming up uh, over the course of the next two years assuming they get their ballot signatures in, um, which I do believe they will, since there's no real deadline for them uh, until you know a year from now, um, given the uh, emergency uh, preamble went into effect. Um, so they'll get that on the ballot, is my guess, and then there'll be a full campaign of education. And the best way to, to win those battles is to make sure we actually do the education of our friends and, and family members who may not be paying attention to these issues. Yeah, and I just wanted to end on that very note. There was a comment in the chat too about um, fighting misinformation and the importance of education and you sharing this information with us. Chair Day is a big part of fighting misinformation. Folks having detailed information, the language with which to talk about this is tremendously important. So on behalf of all of us, I just wanna say thank you for taking the time to educate us and to be with us and explain this really important uh, bill legislation that got passed so that folks have a more nuanced view of it. And I'm just going to ask for our coalition community to just share some appreciation with you for all of the work that you did to make this legislation happen and for being with us this evening. Well, very kind of you all. Thank you very much. Um, stay engaged. I don't need to tell this group to stay engaged, but um, don't hesitate to reach out to my office or me directly with any questions. I know Ruth, you're not a do that very effectively, uh, but don't stop doing that either as we, we go into the next phase of this. But thank you all very much for the work you're all doing. Thank you, Chair Day. And you're certainly welcome to hang out with us for a little while longer as we finish the meeting, but fully understand if you need to get on with your evening. With I've, other got things. Get on, I've got to get on the ice to coach and yell at kids in about uh, 35 minutes. So I appreciate the time and, and let me go at this stage. Thank you so much. Thank you all. 
Excellent. So, and I just want to reiterate again, just thanks to all of you on the screen. You've all been a part of this advocacy work and supporting the work of the coalition in so many different ways. And we could not have reached this moment without everyone's support. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to our policy director, Emily Popke, to share a bit more information about what's coming next with this referendum process. Emily? Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Um, I think that Chair Day did a pretty good thorough summary of where we are at in the process. Um, we are really approaching the deadline that the um, opponents have to get their signatures filed. They need to have 37,000 and change signatures by October 9th. Those signatures need to get submitted to the Secretary of State. Um, and just because they submit those signatures does not mean that all of those signatures will be um, valid. The Secretary of State needs to then go through and certify that all of these signatures came from real people who are registered voters in the Commonwealth. Um, so if that, you know, if those numbers are met and then those signatures are certified, um, like Chair Day said, luckily the bill will still go into effect and cannot be suspended for the next two years, but the bill will then be up for a vote in 2026. Um, I, someone in the chat had asked what happens if they don't meet those numbers. And um, I am pretty sure that if they don't, if they don't get those numbers, then this goes away and they cannot do it again. Um, there's a pretty limited window of time after the bill is passed that they are able to file this referendum petition. So um, if they're unsuccessful, they're unsuccessful. And that's that. Um, and sorry, I'm seeing more questions in the chat. Um, when Chair Day, because of the the preamble, if the governor had not added preamble and they got a slightly higher number of signatures, they needed to get 49,000 signatures to get this on the ballot. If there was no preamble, then the bill would have been suspended until 2026. And then if the bill was approved in 2026, it would then go into effect. And if it was repealed, it would not. Um, but because of the preamble, the bill should go into the law will will be enacted tomorrow. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, Janet. Um, but as far as what we are doing, we are just still watching and waiting. You know, we are waiting to see if they get these signatures in and if these signatures are certified, uh, there is a chance that they won't. Um, and then after that, they will, um, you, we are still working on what our plan will look like. Um, this is going to be a really long and slow process. And so we are still really just um, working with our partners to figure out what our best course of action is. And our plan is to keep you all as informed and in the loop as, as soon as we learn new information. And I will pass back to you, Ruth. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in because I know there's some questions in the chat about something that Chair Day said about whether they would have until next year for the signatures. We were not under the impression that that is the case, so we will get some more clarity on that um, because we have been working under the assumption that the, the deadlines that Emily mentioned before were just to get the bill on the ballot one way or the other, but the preamble means that the law can be implemented. So stay tuned for some more details on that, and we will just get triple check that our assumptions around that are correct, because uh, that will certainly affect uh, the timing of all of these things. Um, and just thank you to Emily for that information. As you can tell from our conversation, being able to educate the general public about what is in this legislation and the importance of it to saving lives is gonna be a critical part of how we move forward. Um, and we will be asking all of you to support us with the work of getting the word out uh, to folks who have not been so connected to the creation and the passing of this legislation so that they understand why this is so important and why we need to work to protect it. Um, so stay tuned for some more details about some of those efforts. We've been doing a lot of work internally to really set up some infrastructure to educate folks and protect this legislation. Um, and we will be sharing much more details with you as time goes on. Uh, if folks have other questions, we have a couple of more minutes, uh, but otherwise we really hope that you can join us on October 8th uh, for this event at Long Live Roxbury. It's a chance to be together in community um, and celebrate the work that has happened and celebrate our coalition community. 
Uh, and we really look forward to hopefully being with you in person and if not seeing you at an event very soon. And just another huge thank you to all of you for being such an essential part of this work. Um, we will definitely follow up with you so with some more details just to clarify those dates and how that works, just so we are on the same and correct page. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. But otherwise, uh, we'll give everyone a few minutes back and I hope that you'll have a really good evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.